Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's really a pleasure to be here. And I just, uh, two things I'd like to say. First of all, I don't know what the state of California would do without Deborah Galino. Um, the investment that the industry has made in the uh, in FPS is only matched by Deborah's energy, which is allowing us to have really, really good plant material. And I assure you that our industry is uh, moving ahead because we've got such interesting things to work with, not only the conventional international varieties, but all the oddball things that, that I also love, as uh, Randall Graham calls them, the ugly duckling varieties that occasionally start, are starting to emerge and really show some good things, especially uh, interesting wine grapes for warm places. So I work with Sauvignon Blanc in Lake and Mendocino counties, and, and we have approximately 15% of the acreage in California, and uh, we're a little bit different than other places because we tend to be high elevation, particularly in Lake County. Lake County uh, elevation is about 1,300 feet right around Clear Lake, where most of the Sauvignon Blanc is grown. And another special quality of Sauvignon Blanc that I never understood until I got into Lake County is that it tolerates magnesium in the soil much better than anything else I've ever seen. Uh, when, when we plant Chardonnay in these Clear Lake clay soils uh, around the lake, it gets very sick looking uh, after a few years and very potassium deficient. And on the other hand, the Sauvignon Blanc just seems to thrive, and all the magnesium is coming out of our ultramafic rocks and the uh, uh, serpentine Franciscan structures that are typical of the coast. So that's one of the qualities when people show me a Clear Lake clay and say, what well, can I grow here? And I say, there's really only one thing, and that's Sauvignon Blanc. So uh, the first part of this is the clonal trial, and I, I got the idea of doing this after working with the, another very large clonal trial of Pinot Noir, and as that came to an end, I thought, well, I have to keep the act going. So uh, Sauvignon Blanc was an obvious one because 99.9% .9 of the industry, both here and in New Zealand, is based on one clone, and I thought just from the point of view of biodiversity, that's probably not a real secure position and that we should have some other things to look at. And knowing that uh, Deborah was amassing a large collection, I thought it's time that we really took a look at them. So our uh, objective was to evaluate these new materials and uh, give us a chance to really look at them hands-on. So um, at Fetzer Vineyards in, in Hopland is where we set this up, and right next door is the, the trellis trial, which I'm also going to talk about. So we have 12 clones. It was designed as a randomized complete block analysis of variance uh, statistical design so that we could actually make uh, means comparisons from a stati statistical perspective. That being said, you know, I, I, typically to most growers, if they can't see the difference and they need statistics to understand it, it probably isn't a real difference. Um, and, but from an academic point of view, it's a great exercise. So uh, we, we used uh, five vine replications uh, uh, and eight of them in the trial, 40 vines total for each entry. It was planted in an eight foot uh, wide rows, seven feet apart in the rows, because it's a fairly vigorous site, very, very nice Russian River loam soils. And it was planted in spring 2004 as green growers. Our rootstock was 10114. We used a VSP trellis design. It's drip irrigated, and um, I believe we're cane pruning it now. So here's uh, the en entrees into the experiment. Uh, UC FPS number one from California, the old Wente clone. Uh, clones six and seven from Italy, and uh, we touched on this briefly. They were from uh, the Institute of Coniano. Uh, clone 14 from France, which is CTPS 316, which you heard about a little bit today uh, from Jean-Michel. And uh, clone 17, uh, ISV1. Clone 18 is also from France which is 317, so we have those two clones that you've already seen a little bit of data on, 316 and 317. And then uh, clone 20 from France, which is CTPS 242, which you also heard about. T clone 22 is the Napa, Napa Heritage clone, and clone 23 is the Kendall Jackson clone. Clone 25 is uh, CTPS 378, which we also heard about. Uh, clone 26 is the another Napa Heritage clone, and clone 27 is a Sauvignon Musquet. I think a picture's worth a thousand words, and this is a really good way to, to present the difference in clones, and you can see what they were selected for. Uh, some of them are, are big yielding clones. 
I think the first round of clonal selection in most places was for yield because a lot of virus affected plants were just really, really unhealthy. So it was kind of the object of most of the people in clonal selection programs to first get some, some good yields. So <clears throat> we can see FPS1, not unusual for it to have wings on the clusters. And uh, from, from France, uh, CTPS242 is a very good yielder. Um, and, and again, from what Jean-Michel said, that was from one of the early selection programs where they wanted things true to type and uh, healthy. And then from Italy, Clone 17, FES 17 is a, a quite good yielder. And then you can see we also have some cl uh, um, selections that are much smaller and a little bit more open. And these probably were selected uh, in the second round looking for uh, issues related to either quality or rot. So uh, the further north you get, the smaller a lot of times people want the clusters to be so you can ripen them. You're not looking for big loads if you're trying to work in a climate like Oregon, for instance. So FPS 1 in Oregon is a challenge unless you're in the southern part of the state. So the Oregonians are watching my trial and they're interested in it because they'd like to grow some Sauvignon Blanc and now we're getting some data on particularly the French selections. They are uh, hoping to maybe plant some of this in their state. So this is pretty typical of what the plants look like. As I said, they're cane pruned. This was in 2008 harvest. 2008 was the year that God visited wrath upon the, uh, the county of Mendocino, starting first with 29 uh, freezing nights, which we haven't seen since the 1970s, followed by forest fires in which we smoked everything. So it was really, really a tough year. So I'm sure that um, Pat Robertson figured that there are... are, uh, <clears throat> are how shall I put this delicately? Our uh, unholy lifestyle caught up with us and God uh, visited wrath upon the county of Mendocino. And there certainly is a lot of material to work with there. <laughs> so this kind of shows that this is sort of a summary of what did the harvest look like when we added everything up out of our plot. And you can see 2007, which was about uh, the fourth leaf, or third leaf actually, um, this was our, our total trial yield from all the vines. And then we fell in 2008 because even though we frost protected, it got so cold on the night of April 20th that with low dew points and cold temperatures, which went down to about 23, we really pushed the extremes of frost protection with sprinklers. That's about the end of the line. So we could see that we had a yield reduction. And it also uh, was the second year of a drought. So it was as if the vines knew this was not a good year to have a particularly big yield and uh, it really affected everything in the plot. And then we bounced back last year in 2009. You can see the yields went up again. So as we look at data, keep this in mind that 2008 was kind of a light yield year. We also figured out by harvest in 2008 that we had better not uh, have a lot of skin tack and we uh, contact and we had better uh, harvest cool uh, because that's part of the protocol of trying to keep smoke flavors from skin getting into the wine. And it worked very, very well. And they also separated press fractions. So the stuff that got squeezed hard was kept separate. And uh, surprisingly, the white wine harvest in Mendocino County went pretty well. We really were not smoke affected. It was quite a bit tougher with red grapes because you have to have skin contact there. So they're still working through some of those problems. Here's kind of a look at a uh, comparison, and as you can see, there are some definite high-yielding clones like FPS1 and uh, um, FPS25 are really, if, if you want yield, this is what you want to plant. So if the objective is to have really good yields, the clones can make a difference for you. If on the other hand, you're in kind of a marginal place where you're having trouble ripening fruit, then you're going to go for some of these clones that naturally have a smaller crop load. They're going to be a better choice for you. Um, so much like we learned with the Dijon clones for Chardonnay in Oregon, it was very difficult to, to use clone uh, for Chardonnay up there, but uh, the, the Dijon clones work quite well in terms of getting things right. So there are statistical differences in yields between these plants. So we know we have a lot of diversity in, from, from that perspective. And again, in terms of uh, adaptability and adaptation for those marginal sites, you probably want for, uh, selections that are a little bit lower yielding and have smaller clusters and more open clusters. Here we are looking at uh, yield per, per uh, meter of cordon. 
and it follows pretty much the same pattern um, as it does per vine. This is uh, kind of a tons per acre look at things, and you can see that this is a pretty good site. Normally, we can, with the best clones, we'd be getting over six tons an acre, like cl clone one right there. But um, you can also see that other clones, like seven and, and 14, much, much lower yields because of the relative cluster size. Here's our average fine uh, cluster count. And they're fairly similar. I mean, uh, there are statistical differences, but for the most part, we're trying to get them the same by, by having the same bud numbers, uh, yet there are some clones that just evidently are less fertile than others and tend to be uh, lower yielding. So the yield component is kind of a combination of small clusters and fewer of them in some cases, whereas the higher yielding clones tend to have a pretty good set. Here's our average cluster weights, and again, we can see statistical differences between them, uh, some being quite big. Uh, FPS 23 and some of them being quite small. So um, FPS 7 and 14 were two that were consistently smaller than the others. This is a relative ripeness and a lot of this has to do with crop load. We, we picked out the same time which is not really the right way to do a clonal trial if you're going to be making wine. But uh, the way that the labor situation works where, where I am with Fetzer, they're saying, we're going to be crushing Sauvignon Blanc tomorrow, so you better get out and harvest that stuff and throw it in the bin. So we have to take it pretty much as, as it comes. So uh, our target for uh, Fetzer is to, to be between 22, well, 21 and a half and 23 degrees bricks is really where they like to pick. 22 is considered optimum for what they want to do. So um, some we were right on the mark and others we missed. And generally the ones with the highest bricks tend to be the ones with the smaller clusters. It's relatively warm uh, in Hopman where this trial is. It's a solid region three, probably with about 3,100 uh, degree hours. And um, this is how they performed. Here's the yield to pruning weights. <clears throat> um, and you can see that we're probably undercropping these a little bit. Most of these things are under four. There's FPS 23 is way up there. I don't know if that's real, if that's a mistake. Sometimes my technician inverts numbers. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> uh, you can see that we're we're, these vines are still growing, so we probably have a little bit more vegetation than we do fruit. We're finally to the point, I think, this year that we'll really have fully mature vines. Berry weights, uh, surprisingly similar. Uh, there, there are differences, but they're surprisingly similar. Uh, this is the pH of the fruit, and you can see that they're, they're fairly consistent too. There really isn't too many real outlying points on this. There are some uh, statistical differences, but by and large, they're pretty similar in terms of pH. And uh, our fruit usually is a little more acidic than this. Um, the pHs were getting a little bit high um, in particularly 2007, 2008. 2009 is a little bit more normal because that was a more normal harvest. And we would expect for Sauvignon Blanc in our region to be picked right around 3.2 to 3.3. And in fact, some winemakers prefer to really do a pH uh, pick rather than a sugar pick in determining when they're gonna do uh, their winemaking. Okay, titratable acidity. Again, differences, and basically the more ripe it is, the less titratable acidity you have. And, and stylistically, I think we like to see Sauvignons with pretty good acid, maybe not quite to New Zealand standards, but, um, or f uh, French standards, like a Sancerre or something. But uh, nonetheless, it, it tends to be picked on the more acidic uh, side. So that's basically it. Uh, bottom line, how to summarize this, you've got a lot of diversity to choose from. Um, the, there's a wide range of, of uh, characteristics to the clusters, and I would say based on yield and so far, fourth uh, FPS1 is a very good clone and suits the needs of a lot of Sauvignon Blanc growers. I don't, I don't see anything in our trial that would automatically say we should replace it. Although the uh, French 242, which is clone 20, did I say? I, I can't remember this. I haven't got it committed to memory. Uh, clone 242 from the, uh, the Antal program is also a very, very good yielder. 
So the next part is trellising. What do you, how do you trellis Sauvignon Blanc to make it work? And there's a couple things to consider here. First of all, there's getting enough bud numbers out there because as you can see, our pruning weight to, to yield uh, fruit ratios tend to be um, showing that we're undercropping it a little bit. So it'd be a good idea if we could get that up some. That's a four cane stack system that we used in, in that program, much like they're using in New Zealand. So I've been watching what different Sauvignon Blanc growers are doing. A lot of people use cordons, and that's a really good, easy way to train. It, uh, the, the drawback of a cordon prune system is that as the vines get older, they have a tendency to uh, have a lot of wood rot or organisms in them. And since, particularly in Mendocino County, where we live in a forest ecosystem, there's lots of, of hosts uh, for Eutypa and on bot canker and other things. So. Uh, that's really what nature wants to do is rot wood. So anytime that we have uh, uh, open wounds, it's likely to happen. So there's been a lot of research on that, and we've learned to prune late. And Doug Googler also has done some great work looking at uh, lime sulfur as a way of stopping a lot of these wood organisms from uh, sporulating and infecting the plants. But even so, if we had less wood and, and more one-year-old uh, fresh canes in there, we think that's the way to go. So cane pruning is, is starting to become more common, particularly in Lake County. So our, our trial objectives were to maximize yield, uniform ripeness, we want high quality fruit, and have it so that it could be mechanized. So that kind of pushes us towards VSP architecture. So this is what we did. We, we chose five treatments and uh, we used a, a VSP with spur pruning, we used a VSP with four uh, stacked canes, as you saw earlier, um, from New Zealand. We do a VSP with a spur prune, but floppy. So the idea is to have sort of a flop and drop system that would make a little bit more of a parasol uh, over the fruit during the summertime to avoid burning, because I think sunburning is really an issue, and it really affects the, the fruit negatively some years. Uh, then we have a hybrid cane system, and finally, uh, four canes that are parallel. And the hybrid cane system is kind of interesting because it uses cordons and then a spur and a short cane. So there's four spurs and short canes, and you bring the, uh, and we'll go through and we'll take a look at it. It'll be easier once we see a picture. So there's cordon pruning. This is just, before we uh, long pruned this and came back and, and uh, adjusted everything so our bud counts were similar, but basically they're two bud spurs. And this is kind of what it looks like at harvest. Uh, you get a lot of fruit on top of fruit. This is the thing that we sort of don't like with, uh, with some of these systems. And especially towards the center of the plant, it can get very, very loaded with fruit. And uh, if you're hand harvesting, the peduncle is short on these, so you start really hacking away with your knife trying to get these things off. And you get covered with juice and sticky, and I don't like that. So fruit on fruit is a real problem with this sort of system. Here's four canes that are stacked, which was like you saw earlier and um, from New Zealand. And the stacked canes are a little better, but you, you still get fruit on top of fruit. And when we look at the, uh, the chemical analysis too, you'll see that the, the fruit ripeness is not uniform. Here's our hybrid cane system. It's a little hard to follow looking at this picture, but basically what you have is a combination. Whoops, let's go back. What you have here is, is a cordon, and then um, this is early on, so this is the first year that we're really training it, but normally there would be a spur here, and then a short cane, and we would we'd have spurs and short canes, so four of each. And then you come back and you kind of rub the buds out and get all the fruit right up in here. So basically you have a continuous line of fruit um, in the vineyard. So it's used in Chardonnay in our area, and, uh, and talking with Don Lavisi, it's also been used, I guess, for table grapes. So it's an approach to sort of maximizing the amount of fruit that you have in just a single layer of canopy, very well adapted to mechanical harvest. And here it is at harvest. See how nice this, whoops, sorry, I keep hitting the wrong switch. See how you have a really nice line of fruit? So it's pretty easy to harvest as well. You don't have as much fruit on fruit and uh, it's, it yields well. This is a system used in Lake County that has four parallel canes, they're side by side, so you sort of have a VSP architecture, it can be mechanically harvested, but uh, the fruit's separated and uh, in the same plane, and we find that uh, compared to stack canes, that the ripeness uh, in this is a little bit better as you go to harvest, and the yields are good. 
there it is at harvest, so you've got some physical separation. It's kind of like a divided canopy, only squeezed in, so it kind of goes against Richard Smart's idea that you have to have separation between the two uh, planes of canopy. And uh, we're not finding that to be necessary, but it probably does affect ripeness uh, some, and you'll see that too when we get to, to the data. And this is kind of looking down on it, and you can see the level of separation. So we get pretty good fruit separation in this, which is good because you don't have fruit on top of fruit. Um, <clears throat> okay, so this is the average yield in tons per acre in 2008 and then 2009. You can see, again, I explained to you that we 2008 was just a, not a great year. Um, and then 2009, the average uh, tons per acre in our plots was closer to 7.8 tons. Here we have a look at the cluster count per, per vine uh, between the, the different systems, and they're, they're uh, pretty close. There's slight differences in them. We're getting a little bit more in the four parallel cane treatment, but overall our, our cluster counts are pretty close because we try to adjust to make our bud numbers the same, so we don't see huge differences between the different uh, trellis systems. Uh, the yield, so we get a little bit higher with the uh, uh, four parallel canes, actually significantly higher in some cases, and the others tend to be a little bit closer because I, uh, four parallel canes seem to set better for some reason. Here's our average cluster weights, and again, not huge differences. We can see that the bilateral flop system had slightly uh, higher cluster weights, and the four parallel canes did, uh, canes did too, but I don't think that they're really highly significant. Um, but we are seeing a little bit more weight with bigger clusters in the four parallel canes. It seems to be a good efficient use of the uh, photosynthetic area. Our yield to pruning weights, though, are, are interestingly different. You can see that um, <clears throat> uh, treatment five, which is the um, four cane system, we're actually putting on uh, a little proportionally more fruit than the others. And it'll be reflected when we look at the fruit chemistry. Average berry weights, they tend to be uh, significantly different. And again, the four parallel cane seems to have bigger clusters with bigger berries. Uh, pH uh, in, is fairly similar between them. A little bit uh, higher pHs in the bilateral flop system for whatever reason. I'm not really sure why. Um, we haven't done leaf area yet in the trial. That's something I hope to do this year and try to get a better understanding of what's going on with the canopies. Bricks, quite different. And you can see, again, the lower crop loads, we tend to get higher amounts of sugar. And uh, this is kind of a problem with our, our four... Uh, well, this is a comparison between the, the north and the south of the, the four parallel uh, cane system, there is a quite significant difference there between the fruit depending upon how much sunshine it's getting. And the same thing with the, uh, the stack canes, we can see uh, significant differences between the fruit that's on the, the top and the fruit that's on the bottom in terms of the level of ripeness. Now the winemaker at Fetzer thought this was great because they were trying to do their Sauvignon Blanc program for Bonterra, which is an organic brand, and they did it by the numbers. They bought a bunch of wine from New Zealand and said, what do people like, and let's look at the numbers. And, and uh, they came to the conclusion that they needed to have some green fruit and some ripe fruit, and when they saw this, they said, hey, perfect, we can do it all in one vineyard. We don't have to source from different vineyards. But that is an issue about trying to get uniform ripeness. and. Um, you know, when you go into these systems where you have stuff that uh, is growing on different sides of the trellis system, it tends to give uh, a lack of uniformity. Titratable acidity, again, significant differences. Basically, some of these things, because they're carrying a little bit bigger crop, they're less ripe. So that's basically the data that I have for... Um, uh, for my trial and my ongoing efforts here. And it's been a lot of fun working with Sauvignon Blanc. It's a variety that's very, very different from others. One other thing I just noticed from the point of view of pest management, this is an organically farmed vineyard, and uh, it's about one of the few vineyards where they really have to worry about leaf hoppers because there's something about all this vigor that Sauvignon Blanc has that, that makes it nice and juicy and really brings in the Pearson sucking insects. And a lot of Fetzer's vineyards, they have pretty good natural biological control, but this is one where they sometimes think maybe we ought to hit this with a little bit of pyganic before harvest so that people aren't, you know, inhaling uh, leaf hoppers as they're picking. Um, so, uh, but now they've gone to mechanical harvest and here it's not quite such a, an issue. 
Uh, I thank my two technicians, uh, Jim and Perlotta, who uh, work with me on this, and they really make everything possible. And also to all the other folks who have helped out in the trial, including Fetzer Vineyards, Lake County, Grapevine Nursery, who supplied the plant material, and of course UCFPS, Deborah Galino, who assisted us in making our choices about what we we're going to take a look at, uh, the American Vineyard Foundation, the Viticulture Consortium West, uh, who uh, funded the trial partially, and of course Nick DeCuslin from Gallo Winery, who kind of encouraged me and, and uh, gave me some ideas about what to do and and uh, then also made these experimental wines, which we can have a chance to, uh, to taste here in a second. My comment about Nick DeCuslin is that I keep teasing him they're going to make Nick DeCuslin the movie, and Bruce Willis is going to get to play Nick DeCuslin. So we'll see.